outside booster separation. Side core booster startup. Incredible views we just had. Beco and separation of the side boosters, and you can see on your left-hand screen that the side boosters have lit back up. They are now in their boost back burn, making their way back down to Earth. In the modern era, it's difficult to imagine a time when we simply didn't know how to explore space, but it certainly existed, and it wasn't even all that long ago. Before the days of NASA, before the days of the Soviet space program, and before even the V-2 testing of World War II Germany, there was a time when we looked up at the sky. We looked up, we studied the stars and their movement, and we wondered if we could ever go there. Today, we explore the work of those who laid the groundwork for the aerospace industry. Those who looked up, dreamed, pondered, and inspired. There are a lot of different kinds of people who contributed to the creation and rise of the space age. We'll begin with those who told stories, hypothetical scenarios that seemed only barely out of reach. We'll move on to those who began to do the math and realize the possibilities in those stories, and then to those who drew out the blueprints, and finally, to those who put the pieces together, it's a long road to the Carmen line. Let's take the first step. The world of fiction, especially science fiction, often relies heavily on speculation. Fiction writers are frequently using their stories as a way to ask, what if? And as a result, some of their ideas end up not being so improbable after all. In fact, sometimes they can become the basis of something that eventually makes its way from the pages of fiction into the fabric of reality. At the end of the 19th century and spilling into the early 20th, fiction began to increasingly focus on the idea of traveling to other planets. For centuries, the ringed world of Saturn, the turbulent gas giant of Jupiter, and the dusty red and presumably terrestrial Mars seemed so out of reach, despite being visible with any telescope. However, in an industrialized world that was becoming increasingly dominated by powerful machines, ideas began to formulate that were only just outside the reach of reality in the minds of fiction writers. French novelist and poet Jules Verne is remembered today for his series Voyage Extraordinaire, a series of adventure novels that would not only involve the exploration of space, but also journeys beneath the oceans and beneath the ground of the earth itself. While Verne would go on to say that he did not consider his works to be scientific, they are the first modern examples of fiction that depicted technology capable of achieving space travel. His ideas, of course, don't actually work. For instance, his 1865 novel From the Earth to the Moon, A Direct Route in 97 Hours, 20 Minutes, involved a group of gun enthusiasts loading themselves into a bullet-like projectile in order to be fired out of a gargantuan space gun, a method that would kill any occupants due to the high acceleration. However, given the lack of empirical data on the subject that existed at the time, some of his figures are remarkably accurate. The Baltimore Gun Club's trip to the moon took just over four days, and the Apollo 11 mission in 1969 would exceed this time by only a few hours. The sequel novel, Around the Moon, further deviates from reality when the spacecraft enters lunar orbit instead of landing, a process that would require propulsion to slow the vehicle down. While entirely impractical, Verne's story left scientists with a desire to somehow realize his goals by other means. Man must explore, and it was with ideas of space guns in our heads that we would eventually discover the solutions. Later, in 1901, English author H.G. Wells would write a similar story called The First Men in the Moon, which made use of entirely theoretical technology to achieve space travel. A pair of protagonists are sent to the moon, 
via a spherical spaceship that utilizes a type of glass that negates the force of gravity, allowing them to travel upward and out of the Earth's atmosphere. The majority of the story focused on a conflict with alien inhabitants on the moon, an insectoid race known as the Selenites, and the politics of alien encounters. Similarly, Wells' earlier novel The War of the Worlds focused less on the science of interstellar travel and instead used the motif of invasion literature to reflect Victorian-era fears about the consequences and morality of colonialism and imperialism. Despite limited scientific merit, these works of what were often called scientific romance would go on to be read by the next generation of the pioneers of spaceflight. At the turn of the century, in the midst of the dust settling after the Industrial Revolution, we would proceed from imagining to putting ideas on paper. From visionaries to mathematicians. Konstantin Tsiolkovsky was a Russian Soviet man born in 1857 and may have been the first person to give serious consideration to the prospect of real-world spaceflight. He was something of an odd man. A recluse by nature, he spent most of his time in a log house on the outskirts of Kaluga, a city about 200 kilometers southwest of Moscow. His work was wide-ranging, beginning with a paper called The Theory of Gases, which outlined the basis of the kinetic theory of gases. However, upon publication, he was informed that all of his discoveries had been made about 25 years earlier. Undaunted, he continued with a paper called The Mechanics of the Animal Organism, which was more favorably received. Later, much of his work would focus around an attempt to construct an all-metal dirigible that could be shrunk or expanded as needed. This work would result in the first Russian aeronautics laboratory, constructed in his apartment, and would also receive a lukewarm response from the scientific community. Disappointed and dejected, Tsiolkovsky would dedicate his later life to alleviating poverty by the time World War I began. However, before this, on May 10, 1897, he would complete an equation that he called the Formula of Aviation, though it would go down in history as Tsiolkovsky's rocket equation, and remains the basis for constructing and launching an orbital rocket to this very day. In 1903, Tsiolkovsky would publish his most famous work, Exploration of Cosmic Space by Means of Reaction Devices. In this paper, Tsiolkovsky utilized the rocket equation to determine a number of things, the main one being orbital velocity. He determined that a spacecraft would need to reach a horizontal velocity of around 5 miles per second in order to maintain the lowest possible orbit around the Earth. Which is accurate. The lowest orbits move at roughly that speed. In a number of additions to this work, Tsiolkovsky would also determine the optimal descent trajectory for a spacecraft returning to Earth, and would become the first to suggest a fuel mixture of liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. While Tsiolkovsky was disillusioned with the lack of response to his work, the idea of spaceflight was now out in the ether, and it wasn't going anywhere. In 1919, an American engineer, physicist, and inventor named Robert H. Goddard published a monograph titled A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. The work focused largely on the mathematics of the relationships between thrust, mass, propellant, and velocity, and like Tsiolkovsky, would contain at least one breakthrough in theoretical rocket technology, the de Laval nozzle. Invented in 1888 by Swedish engineer Gustav de Laval, and originally designed for use in steam turbines, Goddard realized they provided an extreme advantage to the design of a rocket engine. The speed of the gases passing through it will increase if the pipe carrying it is narrowed due to the constant state of the mass flow rate. After passing through the choke point where the nozzle is at its narrowest, the gas begins to expand and its flow will increase to supersonic speeds. An immense amount of thrust could be generated by applying the principles of this nozzle to rocketry. In addition to engine design, Goddard's work also discussed using rockets to achieve escape velocity and leave Earth's gravitational influence, and even included a thought experiment that involved using a rocket to land on the moon and then ignite a mass of flash powder on its surface as a way to verify the landing with telescopes from Earth. Unfortunately, this last part was latched onto by news publications at the time, and Goddard was heavily criticized for what were seen as ideas of pure fantasy. In practical demonstrations, his rockets suffered somewhat from being too small, as Goddard quickly determined that they would work as a method of thrust for larger vehicles. Lacking the resources necessary to show what his designs could achieve, Goddard would quickly find himself stalled and unable to progress. However, from here, all of the groundwork had been laid. The work of the number crunchers is complete, and now would again float into the ether to be picked up later by those who would take the ideas now put to paper and make them a reality.
In the late 1920s, Austro-Hungarian-born German physicist Hermann Oberth created the world's first large-scale experimental rocket program, Opel Rack. Initially drawn to rocketry and spaceflight through the novels of Jules Verne, this program was focused primarily on rocket-assisted land vehicles. It would break a number of land speed records, and even lead to the first rocket-assisted plane, though it did catch fire during its descent. In 1929, Oberth would conduct a static firing of his first liquid-fueled rocket motor, which did run briefly despite lacking a cooling system. He was helped in this experiment by an 18-year-old student, one of Oberth's favorites, by the name of Werner von Braun. Now we finally move on to a somewhat uncomfortable aspect of the birth of spaceflight. While contributions were made from all over the world, Tsiolkovsky in Russia, Goddard in the United States, the true birth of spaceflight would begin in one very specific European country during one very specific period of time. Werner von Braun, after his assistance of Oberth, became heavily involved with rocketry in Germany, partially due to the Treaty of Versailles not including rockets in the list of weapons forbidden to Germany. He began his work as the technical director at the Army Rocket Center in Pinamund, but in 1939 officially demanded to join the National Socialist Party. You may remember this party by its shorter title, the Nazis. Von Braun's politics and allegiance to the Reich are a hotly debated topic. In his own words, he joined the party because, quote, the technical work carried out there had, in the meantime, attracted more and more attention in higher levels. Thus, my refusal to join the party would have meant that I would have had to abandon the work of my life. Therefore, I decided to join. My membership in the party did not involve any political activity. Historian Michael J. Neufeld wrote that, quote, Von Braun, like other Pienemunders, was assigned to the local group in Karl Schagen. There is no evidence that he did more than send in his monthly dues, but he is seen in some photographs with the party's swastika pin on his lapel. It was politically useful to demonstrate his membership. Von Braun's only positive feelings toward the party seemed to be based on the early Nazi promise of restoring Germany out of its serious economic depression that it was left in following the First World War. The ethics of the situation become even further muddied, however, once we reach Von Braun's work in the aggregate rocket program in the early 1940s. The most successful of these rockets was officially called the A-4, and Von Braun had developed it utilizing the rocketry plans of Robert H. Goddard. The A-4 would be better remembered throughout history as the V-2, the world's first long-range ballistic missile. It had a shaky start with a fairly high amount of failed launches, but would soon become a terrifying weapon against the Allied powers. The V-2 would cause over 9,000 deaths from direct attacks, and causing the deaths of over 12,000 concentration camp prisoners during their construction. It is more or less confirmed that Von Braun was aware of the conditions under which the people who built his rockets were in, but couldn't, or wouldn't, do anything about it. Shortly before the end of the war, Von Braun and his team surrendered to U.S. forces when they and the Soviet Army were on their way to the Pienemund Research Center. He would later become a key player in Operation Paperclip, a secret program to employ Nazi scientists in the United States. Von Braun was now tasked with using the V-2 rocket for a new purpose, removing their military payloads and replacing them instead with instruments of science. Now, Von Braun was able to pursue the goals he really wanted, developing multiple complex ideas for more efficient methods of exploring space, but his background left the United States slow to trust him, and most of his proposals would be rejected before the founding of NASA in 1958. From then, he would eventually go on to be NASA's first administrator, his work culminating in the development of the Titanic Saturn V rocket that took men to the moon. There we have the story of the birth of the space age. From conception at the turn of the 20th century with proposals that, despite their sound science, felt like fantasy to those who read it at the time, all the way to the V-2 rocket, which would be the first rocket to ever cross the Kármán line and officially enter space. Out of this period of thought experiments and basic demonstrations of principle would be born an industry that, to date, has performed the following feats. Put human beings into space, put human beings on the moon, sent probes to every planet in the solar system, sent dozens of landers and rovers to Mars, built orbiting laboratories the size of a football field, turned planes into spacecraft, and directly altered the orbital velocity of an asteroid. And this is, of course, not a complete list. Now, I'd like to give you my final thoughts regarding the ethics of the first space rocket and its designer. It is unfortunate that the entire aerospace industry and all work in spaceflight has at least some basis in Nazi Germany. However, it is also true that necessity is the mother of all invention. Due to this, it isn't uncommon that bold discoveries and life-changing technology is made in wartime. 
radar, walkie-talkies, duct tape, jet engines, digital photography, the internet, sun lamps, sanitary napkins, stainless steel, penicillin, satellites, microwave ovens, and much more. All of these are wartime inventions. When lives and sovereignty are at stake, people will put their nose to the grindstone to find a solution to every possible problem. It is again unfortunate that this time around, necessity created inventions on the wrong side of the war, on the wrong side of history. We cannot forget the darkness that spaceflight was born out of, but we can be thankful for the darkness it was pointed at and later fired into, spawning an entire industry that remains, to date, the most ambitious, complicated, innovative, and important endeavor mankind has ever undertaken. When I think about the history of spaceflight, I think about the words of Apollo 15 Commander David Scott as he stood on the surface of the moon. Okay, Houston, as I stand out here in the wonders of the unknown at Hadley, I try to realize there's a fundamental truth to our nature. Man must explore. If you enjoy this content, consider hitting the subscribe button. If you really enjoy this content, consider donating on Patreon, becoming a member, buying some of my books on Amazon, or buying some of my merch. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you over the curve, Space Cowboys. <laughs>